Hey everyone, welcome to episode 87 of The Green Life. In today's episode, we're gonna just explore weight loss. Now, I know this is a tricky one, and our first episode of The Green Life with Dr. Furman was just about weight loss, and we talked about how to achieve that naturally, without effort and without dieting. But today, we're gonna drill a little bit deeper into this with nutritionist Louise Digby. We're gonna go into the connection between our gut health and weight loss, from her perspective as a nutritional therapist, we've seen many, many women struggle with weight loss and really focusing on creating plans that are specialized for each individual's need. So that's a very brilliant thing to do, and especially working with women. As we get older, we may struggle. Our gut health is so important, we don't talk about it enough. So Louise is gonna share all her wisdom and knowledge with us today. Now, before we get into the episode, big shout out to Nama Well for the J2 juicer and the C2 two amazing machines that you want to have in your kitchen if you are really thinking about having more plants in your life in the form of juices and smoothies and soups and creams, you name it. With the C2 actually, you can really do everything and more because the blender is super powerful. You can even heat your soup up. Now, if you want a discount code, I have 10% in the show notes for you. I am not making any money out of this. It's really a gift to you guys. Now, I do have a, an affiliate account with Dr. Morse's Herbs, and as you know, I work towards my naturopathic doctor certification, so I really focus on detoxification in a way that is appropriate, but also that actually works and supports the organs in your body in doing so. It's not a fad, and so, but if you want to do so, you need herbs, because the herbs really promote the health and well-being of each or- organs. I've been working with Dr. Morse's Herbs for almost a year now i absolutely love them i use them myself so if you want to know a little bit more and you want to get yours go into the show notes and use the link and also you get five percent for your first purchase it's only for your first purchase so i would suggest doing a big one for the beginning so you can get a big discount if you want to know more get in touch with me and i'm happy to share we also have a retreat here in portugal which we are looking for amazing individuals next year to host their retreats at So if you are a practitioner, meditator, whatever you are, you want to come and host your retreat, we are here to support. So everything in the show notes as well as my website to work with me if you want to get healthy in 2024. All right, without further ado, let's dive into the conversation with our beautiful guest today. Welcome, Louise. Hi, Louise. Thank you so much for joining me on The Green Life today. How are you? Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm really good. Thank you. Awesome. So I'm really excited to talk to you about your expertise. But before we get into the subject, which is uh, how yo-yo dieting affects the microbiome and the microbiome on its own is a big subject. I'd like you to just introduce yourself for my listeners and really, you know, share your journey and why you got interested in nutrition and why you actually specifically got interested into hormone balancing and women's health. That would be amazing. Sure. So for me, I got into nutrition. I went straight into it from college. Uh, It was always something that that was of interest to me. And I I think that's because my mum always had a really strong interest in nutrition. So I was really brought up with quite a good understanding of, you know, what food does for the body and what it means to eat healthily. Um, so it was very natural for me to, to go into that and start studying that in more detail. And then when I, when I graduated and qualified, I started working with everyone and anyone who had anything, you know, whether that was, uh, wanting to lose weight or whether it was diabetes or IBS or fatigue or whatever it was, I worked with everyone and anyone. And what I noticed in the people that I worked with was that pretty much everyone wanted to lose weight. Now, whether they came to me for IBS or chronic fatigue or whatever it was, they all had this side goal of wanting to lose some weight. Um, So that led to me building up my knowledge in weight loss. But what I noticed was that women who are getting closer to menopause, really over the age of 35, 40, are the ones that struggle the most when it comes to losing weight. And the typical approaches just don't seem to work. You know, cutting calories and exercising more, doing various diets, they just don't seem to work. And there's good reason for that because they aren't great ways of losing weight for anyone. But 
particularly as women get closer to menopause, the way that their metabolism changes and their hormones change means that just cutting calories isn't going to be enough to to lose the weight. You know, we need to go deeper and work on the hormones and the gut bacteria and inflammation and all these different things. So I ended up specializing in that area because I think because I saw such poor results for women in that age range that I kind of made it my mission to kind of crack that and make it much easier for for women to maintain a healthy weight as they get older. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah, I agree with you. I think one of the issues is that a lot of the information that are shared publicly are also catered to men really and made by men. So they really forget about how complex our bodies are as women. And um, and so we definitely need more education. I mean, even hormone studies, you know, there's not much on menopause even in comparison to hormones for men, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's like a a prime example is fasting. Mm. You know, a few years ago, there was so much hype around fasting, but all of that information came from studies on men. You know, the studies that showed that it helps you to lose weight came from studies on men. And what more recent studies have shown is that fasting for women, yes, it does help with improving blood glucose management and cholesterol and all of those things, it doesn't actually really help with weight loss for women. There will be some women where it does help them, but those women likely have a better foundation in terms of their hormones are more balanced. They're probably sleeping well, managing stress well. And so fasting is a a tool that can work really well for them. Mm. But the vast majority of women that come to see me don't have that solid foundation in place. So adding in fasting can end up just making everything worse and actually make them gain weight rather than lose weight. Yeah, I agree. For me, fasting works because I already know how to tackle everything else and I've managed mm-hmm. to balance it out, but definitely it doesn't work for everybody. Yeah. Um, especially when with thyroid issues, if especially if uh, Hashimoto's is just not a good idea. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, definitely personalized approach, which is what I believe you actually um, cater to and focus on. So let's get into the topic of microbiome though well I don't know if you want to start first with yo-yo dieting because I feel like that's actually a good segue but uh the the, you know the foundation of microbiome a lot of people might they should know what it is but a lot of people still don't know what the microbiome is um maybe we'll start there uh with the microbiome and explaining what it means and uh you know so people understand and can visualize it Sure. Well, the microbiome is your makeup of bacteria and yeasts in your gut. And we have microbiomes in other places in the body, but generally when we're talking about the microbiome, we tend to be talking about the gut. Um, And it's made up of bacteria that can be live really harmonious with us and help us to digest our food and create vitamins for us and create anti-inflammatory compounds for us and there are some bacteria that can be less helpful and can can cause inflammation and drive cravings and disrupt your appetite Uh, can cause symptoms like bloating and constipation Uh, and same for yeast there are ones that are beneficial and ones that are less beneficial but it's all about the balance because it's normal to have all of these things and it's about having plenty of different species of bacteria and plenty of the ones that actually do some work for us and help us with our digestion, with our hormone elimination, um, with our vitamin synthesis and and all of those things. So that's what the microbiome is. And, And mainly it's in our large intestine. Um, and that's where we want it to be. And we can, develop problems when it can start to migrate up into the small intestine more than it should do. Um, And problems can occur with the microbiome for many, many reasons. And um, that's why it's so common for there to be disruption in the microbiome. Um, You know, if someone has a lot of antibiotics, if someone has a lot of stress, uh, other medications can cause disruption if someone isn't chewing their food properly and their stomach acid level isn't optimal, that can disrupt the gut microbiome. 
um, if you're not sleeping properly, if your immune system is run down, loads of things can impact it. So it's really, really common that it's not going to be optimal. Yeah, true. And um, so understanding this uh, wonderful balance that we need in our gut and how it can keep us, keep us healthy, uh, when it comes to um, dieting, because it's something that most women find find themselves doing since teenage years right your hormones mm-hmm. start changing you were a kid you were like no worries and then you start developing breasts and hips and a lot of women obviously are you know faced by the media showing a certain body type that is ideal and we don't mm-hmm. all look the same so how how do how does dieting that culture and how we get into it affect our microbiome and what can we do to actually stop um, doing things that maybe will make us lose weight long, uh, short term, but long term will create more problems. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of those diets that do help you lose weight in the short term, they do make you gain weight in the long term. And one of the big reasons for that is because of how it disrupts your gut microbiome. When you, you go on a diet, excuse me, when you go on a diet, you, um, you typically cut out a food group or it might be a range of foods that you cut out. And that restriction, it de- it deprives your gut bacteria of fuel. So let's say that you go on a diet that's low carb. Well, carbohydrates are where we get our fiber from. So if you go on a low carb diet, or at least a very low carb diet, then you're depriving your gut bacteria of its main source of fuel because fiber is really what fuels our gut bacteria. And to keep our gut bacteria happy, we have to feed it. You know, it needs to get the right fuel to be in that optimal balance. So when we start taking away that fuel or reducing the amount of fuel or the variety of the fuel, then we start losing the diversity in our gut bacteria and that's when we can start to develop problems and that's something that tends to develop over a long period of time you know if if you've just got a couple of weeks where your diet changes then it's not going to be a big deal but if you're repeatedly dieting and repeatedly uh, kind of reducing the diversity in your diet that is going to have a long-term impact on that gut balance and the gut microbiome so there's that side of things but then also with dieting we often have a lot of processed foods that come into the diet and things that can be very high in artificial sweeteners and additives uh, you know fillers and binders things that try to make diet food taste like real food and those things are not good for your gut bacteria either you know, research has shown that artificial sweeteners disrupt the gut bacteria and can actually drive weight gain because of that disruption. They can make you hungrier and can even disrupt your blood sugars, even though they are there to replace the sugar. So the impact of going on a diet on your gut bacteria is massive. Do you think there is a misunderstanding from for people because of the language used in marketing uh, about diet, what diet actually means? And then uh, people look at diet products and they think, oh, they're good for me. Can we just clarify what diet should mean versus what it does in the marketing space in a commercial setting? Yeah, absolutely. We tend to associate the word diet with a negative thing with you know cutting things out but what diet really means is just what you eat and having a healthy diet means having a variety and having a bit of everything and not restricting you know not cutting things out because for to be healthy and to have a healthy gut microbiome we have to have a big variety of foods you know different fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds and fats and fibers and all of these things they all contribute to a healthy microbiome so if we're missing out any of those things then we're going to start seeing a deterioration in health eventually yeah okay thank you for that i the the reason i wanted to go there is because i feel like everybody's obsessed with calories and so calorie restriction 
uh, always means diet for people, right? Mm. Um, instead of actually diet corresponding nutrients and nutrition and a balanced nutritional approach to how you eat, which is which should be really education at school level, right? They should kids should learn about nutrition in school. Really, the parents should learn because, um, as you mentioned before, when it comes to diet, a lot of the product that are catered to that, using the word in the marketing context. Uh, so weight loss are hyper processed. So mm. I like your opinion on programs like Weight Watchers and uh, Slimming Worlds, like these big companies that have made not only a big business out of you know their group coaching, but actually the product that they have are on the market to sustain or support their programs. Yeah. So. With those types of approaches, they are only thinking about the amount of food that you're eating. They're, they're just different ways of doing the same thing. And that's the same with pretty much most diets. They're, they're all different creative ways of getting you to eat less. And by just focusing on the amount of food you're eating, you're completely overlooking the importance of the quality of the food that you're eating and the nutritional value. And you know, you can quite happily be in a in a calorie deficit or a point deficit or a sin deficit, whichever diet you're following, you can quite happily be in that deficit and completely miss all of your nutritional needs. You know, you can, you know, basically just live off pasta or just live off, you know, a very narrow range of foods and technically be hitting your goals but actually you're missing out on so much that we need to, to be healthy and for our hormones and for our metabolism to work properly and for our gut microbiome to be balanced, we need to make sure that we are getting enough nutrients, we're getting enough protein, we're getting enough carbs and fats because if we don't get enough of those things, we cannot make our hormones in a balanced way. We cannot fuel our metabolism and, and burn fat properly and make energy properly, your thyroid starts to suffer um, because we need a certain amount of fuel for the thyroid to function and we need mm. certain nutrients to make the hormones. And then when all of those things start becoming imbalanced and the gut microbiome starts to become less diverse, then we get really inflamed as well. And that is just a recipe for weight gain and chronic disease. You are so right. I actually, you, as you were saying that, I was thinking about the people I know that follow these programs. Um, they are still overweight uh, and unhealthy. Uh, and the the funny thing is that if you have a conversation with them, they have no problem buying, say, you know, the cookies that are like four points or three points, but then they will not have an avocado because it's too fatty. Yes. And it's like, can we, what? can we just talk about this? And um, so what in these products that they put, like any product, like not branded specifically, but any product that says diet or low fat, why are they impacting us negatively? What is in there that most likely will irritate us and, um, you know, take away from actually even having a food, a real food that has more fat, but is actually more natural and works better for us? So when you take the fat out of something, it tastes bad. <laughs> you know, the fat tastes good. And when you take the fat out, it, it tastes bad. So they have to put chemicals and emulsifiers and fillers in there to bring back that taste and that mouthfeel that fat gives to food. And those are the things that are, they're not really foods that they're putting in there. And they're things that are disruptive to your, your gut bacteria and your body has to process and eliminate. So you're, you're replacing that fat with something that's basically devoid of nutrition. And that's so sad because fat is so nutritious. You know, fat itself, we need to, to make hormones and do lots of things in the body, but usually with fat comes quite a few nutrients you know we've got the fat soluble vitamins which are vitamins a d e and k and when you take out the fat from a food or from your diet you will become deficient in those nutrients quite quickly because we we, we store those nutrients in our body and um you know take out the fat you take out the nutrients and you're going to become deficient 
And that's bad news for your immune system, for your hormones, for your skin particularly. Um, so that's one of the big issues with going, you know, low fat. But also when you when you're going for those low calorie options, um they are basically just really high in sugar and really high in processed carbs. And what that does is you eat that food and you digest those, that sugar and those carbs really quickly because there's no protein and there's no fat in there to slow down the absorption of those sugars. So they give you a blood sugar spike. And when your blood sugars increase, you kind of you feel okay at that time because it gives you a boost of energy. But very quickly afterwards, your blood sugars will crash. And it's at that point where you're going to be feeling hungry. You're going to have cravings for more sugar, more carbs, you're going to be feeling tired, probably not going to be able to concentrate on your work, probably going to want to grab a coffee to give you a, an energy boost. And that's when we get onto that roller coaster of kind of almost like yo yoing through the day where you're just going from one sugar high to the next to get you through. Once you get on that roller coaster of highs and lows with your blood sugars, it's quite difficult to get off of it um, because when your blood sugars are dipping down low, physiologically, what you need to come out of that sugar low is sugar or mm -hmm. carbs. So your body is really clever and really adaptive. So it gives you cravings to make you eat sugar or carbs. And so you have the sugar or carbs, you sh your blood sugars shoot back up again, and then they crash again and you you have more cravings again. So really we need to start the day off right to prevent that blood sugar roller coaster and opting for a low calorie, low sin, low point breakfast is is not usually the way to achieve that because you're focusing on avoiding the calories as opposed to getting getting protein and getting fat into that breakfast. Yeah, to be fair, I mean, we have very different approaches about this, but, uh, uh, you know, I the work the, I work mostly with diabetes and I do it on a high carb diet, but I think it's really important to understand what kind of carbs we're talking about. Mm. That makes a difference. Of course, when we talk about simple carbs and processed foods, we are going to create those mad, massive roller coasters. But also, you mentioned spiking, and that's, you know, we have a rolling range that's normal when you eat. Your sugar will go up. It's normal. I think it's the crashes when you have these simple sugars with the, the void of fiber that will generally create these problems because there is just nothing that maintains a stable descent of the uh, glucose levels. It's normal for glucose to go up and down. I know it's a buzzword right now to talk about spikes. Mm -hmm. Everybody's going on about it. And um, I had a great conversation with uh, Lauren Plunkett and we clarified a few things for people, hopefully. But uh, yeah, it's definitely, in, it's definitely important for people to understand what kind of foods uh, that means. And I think actually if you can give some examples of um, carbs that, are, that, that you say are healthy and they should be you know, uh, chosen versus you know, the cookies and, and the, the crisps and everything else that comes um, in a packet, what is your what? What do you think people should really aim to have in their diets when it comes to carbohydrates? Mm, there's definitely a massive difference between those processed carbs like cookies and cakes, and your whole grain rice and quinoa and those sorts of things. You know, they really should be two different food groups rather than all being lumped into carbs because they are yeah. so different. Um, but yeah, the, the things that we want to be prioritizing carb wise are the ones that have not been messed with. So, you know, oats and brown rice and quinoa, buckwheat, millet, sorghum, um, you know, all those types of unadulterated grains, as well as a butternut squash and sweet potato, normal potatoes, fine all really nutritious things. The root vegetables are great sources of um, those starchier carbs as well. So those are what we want to be choosing when we are adding carbohydrate to our meals. Yeah. And do you, how do you define, uh, obviously you mentioned a lot of the starchy um, carbs, but how do you define then, you know, the other vegetables and fruit? Do you put them when you talk to your clients, do you put them in the category of carbohydrates too, or do you explain the difference between a starchy carb versus a non-starchy carb? 
What's mm. the approach? Because people are confused. That's yeah, for sure. I can totally see why they would be confused because they do all come under that carbohydrate category. Yeah. But um, the, excuse me, the, um, the your typical vegetables, you know, your green leafy vegetables are not starchy. So they kind of come under a different category really and that you can really eat them in abundance. So it's more the above ground veg, the non-root vegetables are ones that we want to incorporate into our diet in complete abundance, get as much of them in as we can. And then the starchy ones, you know, we, we don't need to limit them to any great extent, but we want to just be a little bit more in tune with making sure that that's not all we're having, you know, because mm-hmm. it's some people feel that they are you know, meeting their nutritional requirements by only having those starchier vegetables. So we just want to make sure we get that variety in and we're getting plenty of the, the green stuff and those above ground vegetables as well. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. That will help people a lot. Um, what's your stance on fruit? So fruit is definitely important as well. Um, but again, some people feel that they are getting their five a day or, or whatever they're aiming for um, in a balanced way, but perhaps they're only getting it from fruit. Really, we want to make sure that we're getting the vast majority of our fruit and veg from vegetables and fruit can be you know, a nice addition to that. I don't tend to recommend snacking on fruit because it tends to drive cravings. It tends to make, make people want to eat more sweet things. But having it as part of a meal or having it as a dessert to a meal is a really great option. You know, um, going for the the lower sugar options like berries and cherries are really helpful. They're absolutely packed with antioxidants. So they are a really nice way of supporting your metabolism and your microbiome as well. Yeah. I mean, it, it's funny how, you know, we can approach this in a different way, but I think the common denominator with, with a healthy way of eating is eating real food. Mm. And um, it makes such a difference, you know, because, yeah, it's just very, it's a different experience to the body, to the mind, to everything when you are actually grabbing produce versus something that comes in a package. And yeah. I think it's great to have that message driving through Um because science can prove a lot of uh, theories correctly when it comes to nutrition. This is why nutrition is so, uh, well, expanding a growing science, but also complicated. Mm-hmm. And why, you know, you should work, uh, if, especially if you have health issues, you should work with a professional too, because it's it kind of, it's very confusing and really hard to navigate. Um, but I, I was wondering when it comes to, you know, guidelines, you mentioned uh, we have those five days and, a lot of people think, again, that something that comes from a package can meet their five days because of the way the labels in some countries are constructed. Can we talk about, first of all, is five a day even enough? And also, uh, what what do you think the real guidelines should be for government had to upgrade a little bit? Like in Canada, they did such a good job with the latest upgrade, like, you know, um, Brenda Davis and Ms. Santo Melina were involved into uh, consulting with the government as independents without any financial backing from industry and really advice about, you know, adding more plants and why plant-based is such an important part of actually going, uh, having a balanced uh, guideline versus the years prior where you had, you know, dairy that was like a main focus group and, for, and, so, and, and so on. But this is not happening in every country and we mm. still on this five a day. And um, I wonder what your opinion is about what the guidelines really should say or you see actually benefits people. What the the research tells us is that five day isn't enough, um, but it's a good target because a lot of people are barely getting one or two a day. Um, what the World Health Organization has said is that it's more like 10 a day that we should be aiming for. And really that should look like seven vegetables and free fruit or six vegetables and four fruit roughly from unprocessed sources because like you say there's some clever marketing out there that tells us that it's one of our five a day you know for example a tin of baked beans is classed as one of of your five a day um and dried fruit is also classed as it and fruit juice but these are quite processed sources of your fruit and veg and 
with that comes all the sugars, which you wouldn't get in the same way from the whole fruit. When you eat the whole fruit, the whole vegetable, as well as the the nutrients and the natural sugars that are in there, you're getting the fiber. Mm. And the sugars are bound up to fiber, particularly in fruits. And that is a very different way that your body processes that to when you're drinking fruit juice where you've got none of the fiber and all of the sugar. Um, And the impact that that high sugar load has from fruit juice on your body really mitigates some of the nutrients that you get from it. Because when you're having a glass of apple juice, you're not just having an apple, you're having like the sugar from 10 apples. So it's not the same. And uh, definitely getting your fruit and veg from whole fruit sources or whole vegetable sources is what we want to go for. You can definitely do creative things with your fruit and veg to get it in, um, but we don't want to be buying it really in a packet where it has a long ingredients list. Yeah, good. So can we give an example to people on how to implement, for example, let, like a meal plan for a day, how to implement those five a days, but really aiming for 10, what would you suggest um, the meals that they should have should be? So it's easy to get some fruit into breakfast. I personally always buy frozen berries because they're so easy, it means that they're always available in the freezer and you can add frozen berries to any of your breakfast, whether it's porridge or granola or whatever. You can add it to your smoothies. So it's really easy to get some berries in. And if you're having a smoothie, it's easy to add in a handful of spinach. So that's another easy one. Um, Things like apple, also really easy to add into porridge, granola. You can grate it, chop it up, whatever you want to do. So fruit, very easy to get into your breakfast. If you're having eggs for breakfast, then stir frying a little bit of veg, is a great way to go as well. Slicing up a bit of avocado is a great way to go. So really getting one or two portions into your breakfast is quite straightforward. And by the way, a portion is considered to be about 80 grams, which is about the size of a medium apple. Um, Lunches is where a lot of people tend to struggle because it's traditional to have a sandwich, depending on where you're from in the world, but bread at lunchtime is, is quite typical. So trying to move away from those bready lunches really helps. And sorry. No problem. <laughs> and um, opting for salads, soups, um, beans and lentil based uh, lunches is a really good way of, of getting in those, um, getting that, those five or 10 a day because your beans and your lentils count towards that fruit and veg count as well. Um, And then you could follow up your lunch with a sort of dessert, which again could be fruit-based. And then dinner-wise, I always find the easiest way to get in some extra veg is to have what you would usually have and just add a portion of some leafy greens, you know, some broccoli, some cauliflower, some Brussels sprouts, whatever you want to have just adding an extra portion to what you would usually have is the easiest way to go. But you can also just chop up some carrots, some celery, some tomatoes, onions, or whatever it is that you want, really small, add it into the sauce. It's going to add flavor. It's going to add some texture, or you can even blend up the sauce if you want to pretend that the veg isn't there. And, you know, you can definitely sneak in some, some veg. And then, Another way to get in a bit more is to bring in some veg into your snacks. You know, celery, carrots are a great option. Dip it in a bit of hummus and you've got quite a nutritious and uh, satisfying snack as well. Oh, brilliant. I was going to ask you what you thought about the snacking because you mentioned the main meals and uh, earlier you did say you didn't really recommend people would have fruit as snacks, but I'm glad you actually think we can have some more veggies for snacks and have some pulses as well. And um for kids that are complicated sometimes because they might not like, you know, veggies, they want to have what the kid, the friends are having, which is more like pizza and, and, and all mm-hmm. that kind of food. What 
do you think parents could do as an advice? Like, I know that you focus mostly on women, but these women you're focusing on sometimes have children and mm-hmm. they, they definitely don't want to cook like a, a million meals, but also if they're having more veggies for their own health, they probably want to implement it for their kids as well. So what is the trick that you have found really work for your clients when it comes to that? It's all about sneaking the veg in, I think. Um, and what I was just saying about, you know, making a sauce out of veg, the kids are, are not going to know. Um, and you can make a really lovely sauce by basically sauteing whatever veg you want, but things like onions, garlic, carrots, celery, tomatoes. You know, you can make a really nice bolognese sauce, curry sauce, whatever, lasagna sauce. Get loads of veg in there and then use that um, as the sauce for your main. And um, the kids aren't going to know, but they're going to be getting lots of nutrients in there. Um And I think the other thing, sorry, I think the other thing is, um, is to lead by example and, um, you know, the kids see you eating lots of veg and lots of normal whole foods as opposed to diet foods, then in time, that's just going to be normalized for them and they're not going to think too much about it. Um, I think the other thing also is to experiment with how you cook the vegetables for your kids because I know when I grew up boiled veg was just horrible to me bland and disgusting but when I discovered roasted veg just was like a game changer because it it sweetens it up and um you know it tastes completely different so it's worth experimenting with different ways of cooking veg and also getting the kids involved in the cooking because it makes the food a little bit less daunting when they can see how it's been made and they've been involved in putting on flavors and that sort of thing yeah and going back to the microbiome how is how important it is to actually target for the parents to target uh, their children early to avoid uh, microbiome issues and the, what are these issues that we can prevent? It's definitely important to start thinking about it early because so many kids have had a kind of a poor start with their microbiome because of having to take antibiotics or because of maybe um through no fault anyone's fault but you no know, not being born naturally not being able to be breastfed um we know that those that are born naturally as opposed to c-section tend to have a better microbiome those that are breastfed tend to have a better microbiome and if they can avoid antibiotics then great but obviously a lot of these things are outside of our control so there tends to be a a, a not so ideal start in life for many kids when it comes to the microbiome so thinking about it early is really really important um and so getting that variety in not just with fruits and vegetables but also with the different types of grains that they're having herbs and spices uh, nuts and seeds these are all things that contribute you no know, any plant based foods as long as they're unprocessed all contribute to a healthy microbiome and you know i see a lot of kids who are eating a lot of bread and it's not that bread is bad but it's the lack of variety for me that um that is concerning and so trying to move away from just you know bread as their main source of carbohydrate or just potatoes as their main source of carbohydrate and getting that variety in there is going to be really helpful for nurturing their microbiomes and that's so important because what the research is telling us is that having a compromised gut microbiome when you're a child can go on to affect you when you're an adult in terms of making you more prone to carrying excess weight developing chronic conditions as children we know that things like eczema and asthma and hay fever are all linked to a compromised gut microbiome uh being more prone to uh, infections and uh coughs and colds again linked to the gut microbiome so it's important for their immediate health but also for their health as they go through the rest of their lives totally so you mentioned bread and earlier you mentioned how most people have bread even for lunch and I, I lived in the UK for quite a long time so uh, my boss actually when I used to work in banking before I moved on to becoming a nutrition nutritionist and holistic practitioner I 
found that every day he was having a sandwich and and crisps, chips. And um, it was like the most fascinating thing. It was every single day, the same kind of lunch. And so it is quite ingrained in the culture in the UK, especially, which I noticed. But I wonder if you changed anything in your approach to your diet, having gained so much knowledge through your studies and then practicing and noticing how people eat and what it does and how it impacts them. Mm. Yeah, for me, um, I it's not that I, I, I won't eat bread or don't eat bread. I just try to make it a very occasional thing um and really try to base most of my meals around what veg I'm going to be eating Mm -hmm. and that doesn't mean that I'm just having a plate of veg but it's um it's for me about getting that veg into the diet one way or another and if you can get enough veg in add a bit of protein add a bit of fat make sure you've got a little bit starchy carb there then you're probably not going to go too far wrong and be fairly close to meeting your nutritional requirements um, but yeah, I've definitely adapted my diet accordingly and it, and it continues to evolve, you know, based on new research. But um, the main priority for me is making sure that I get plenty of fiber, fat and protein in my breakfast, that my lunch is um, kind of a bit varied uh, from from day to day, because we can, even when you've got a lot of variety in the different breakfast, lunch and dinner that you have, you can still get a bit stuck in eating the same thing every day. So I try to vary it up and one day I'll have a salad and then I might have soup, then I might have an omelette or something like that, uh, just to keep that variety in there. But whatever I'm having, making sure we're getting some veg in there. Mm -hmm. Nice. And I saw from your work that you are very much a spokesperson for personalized nutrition. So there's no one fit all, like one fit all for everybody. So uh, I know also you are a fan of uh, Dr. Tim Spector because of the research that he shared about the microbiome. Mm. And um, I wonder if you uh, work with um, companies like Zoe with your clients to actually find out, you know, how they actually start, what the starting point is. Because obviously with Zoe, what they've done really well, I think, in comparison to other um uh, apps where people are tracking their their glucose or they're tracking their nutritional intake is that it's uh they do those test kits at the beginning to see where people are at and i just wonder if you are implementing these kind of tools in your uh coaching with your clients so that they can actually know you know what's going on with them instead of guest work right mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so not Zoe specifically, but um, when I work with clients, I do run tests on them to find out what's going on with their microbiome, their hormones, their nutrient status, inflammation, toxic load. So we do like a whole suite of tests to find out what is going on for them specifically. Um, because although really everyone comes to us with the same goal, because everyone that I work with is a woman who wants to lose weight. They all have different underlying causes. And it's it's fascinating really that, you know, a group of 20 women all with the same goal and the same problem underneath it all have completely different things going on. One might need to work on their gut microbiome. The other might need to work on their hormones. Someone else might have intolerances or deficiencies. And plenty of them will have all of those things going on and more uh, because they're all things that have kind of accumulated over their entire life. Sometimes it's because of yo-yoing and sometimes it's because of stress or just a very hectic modern lifestyle. Um, so, yeah, personalized approach is, is absolutely essential. You know, some of the more generalized guidance will get people so far but to get that final sort of 30 percent in terms of optimizing your health and getting to your goals you really got to dig down into what you need as an individual um and you know when it comes to things like zoe you know i think you're right they've done a really good job of um taking that really up-to-date research and making it tangible and accessible for the the general public. Um, But I don't tend to use Zoe because there's more detailed tests available to a practitioner. Mm. And that gives us a lot more information about what's actually going on in the gut and what we can do 
with diet, with lifestyle, with supplements, um, just on a more advanced level to get a more radical change in the gut microbiome and, and better results longer term. But I think Zoe is is certainly a great option for someone who can't work with a practitioner or doesn't want to for whatever reason or wants to maybe start on their own um, because there's certainly a lot of useful information that you can gain from that. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely boomed. Like I've seen so many apps, you know, trying to track especially glucose, which is why the conversation about glucose needs to be very, it needs to be had and it's so Mm. important because people are confused even about that and they're freaking Mm. out about spikes and um you know and there are people that are capitalizing on it and, and then this misunderstanding can really make people orthorexic really at the end like they just don't want to eat anything anymore um so it's important to in my opinion to you can do those kind of things they're helpful but work with someone that knows what they're talking about like yourself and try to get a little bit of uh, support so that it, you're not going blind and just following numbers that perhaps are not the full picture um so if someone wanted to work with you what would be the best way and what do you what are your services right now that you offer that would be assisting women that are struggling with weight loss so the best way to find out more about what i do is to visit louisedigbynutrition.com or you can follow me on social media on facebook facebook and instagram i'm on at louisedigbynutrition and um, that will give you a really good insight into to what I do and what my philosophies are. Um, but the main thing that I do with my clients is my program called the Nourish Method. And it's a six month program where we start off with running tests to find out what the individual needs. We spend a lot of time going through their medical history and their symptoms and their health goals and bring all that together with their test results to create a really personalized action plan that is focused on really taking baby steps and nudging them towards where they need to be over over the period of the six months. Because what doesn't work is just overhauling and changing everything at once. It's it's just so difficult to stick to. And to really achieve a transformation that's going to last, we need to change habits and um, we need to work on one thing at a time and do each thing properly. So we will guide you through step by step what it is you need to do to address the underlying imbalances and uh, the weight loss is a happy side effect of that as opposed to us focusing on cutting out foods and counting calories or anything like that yeah perfect i love that and uh any plans for 2024 to launch anything different or having retreats what 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 do you if people wanted to you know like go in depth with you and it's not just about the coaching i wonder if you're thinking about any other projects that you can implement um at the moment no, nothing out of the ordinary for me um no new projects really the way to to go in depth with us is through the nourish method um each i think every other month we run a challenge called the metabolism reset and it's a 5 day challenge where um we focus on a different topic each day and we take a deep dive into each topic and it'll be about things like hormones and why we get stubborn belly fat and toxic load and things like that so not just about um the food but looking at the various different aspects that impact our metabolism and hormones so we go through that over the 5 days and make some tweaks and changes to optimize energy, reduce cravings, and hopefully see some progress on the scales as well. And uh, that's always quite fun because we have prizes and uh, things like that going on. So the next one will be in in January and uh, as I say, run it every other month. And so is that open to the public or just for your uh, clients that are on the program already? That is open to the public, so anyone can join me for that, and I can give you the link to pop into your show notes if you like. Yeah, we'll put everything in the show notes for you. Perfect. Awesome. Amazing. Well, so nice to talk to you, and so glad you're doing this work and really helping women understand their bodies better and also defy you know, the stigma that comes around what happens to us when we get older and as our hormones change. I think it's really important to have that you know, graceful conversation around it because there's a lot of... Um, you know, when it comes to hormones, because they've always uh, been used for, you know, 
kind of tagging women as crazy or there's no hope for you. You're going to gain weight as you get older. And I think it's really unfair. Like it just puts us down and it's not how it should, it's supposed to be. If we look at how most people eat, it's really normal that we suffer when we get to a certain age and everything changes in our body. If we change that mindfully understand what we all require is going to be, a, it's going to make a massive difference. So your work is really important. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, a lot of women go to the doctors and they're just told that, you know, oh, it's just your age, it's just your hormones. And they're almost written off. Often they're just given antidepressants. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're given HRT. Um, and, you know, sometimes those things are needed, mm -hmm. but oftentimes what's really needed is just a, a different approach. You know, what has worked for them up until their mid thirties, forties, isn't going to work for them as their body goes through this quite big transition. Um, so it's it's not that your body is broken. It's just that you need a, a different approach, a more nourishing and nurturing approach. Yeah, totally. Thank you, Louise. It's such a pleasure to have you on. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Talk soon. Bye. Thank you, Louise, for being on the show. And thank you, everyone, for staying on and listening to our conversation about gut health and weight loss. I hope this made sense and you learned a lot. If you want to work with Louise and if you want to know more about her work, go into the show notes. I've linked everything there for you, including the challenges that she hosts so that you can participate. Now, if you like this episode, please remember to share, like, review, help us grow so that we can have more amazing speakers on. And I will see you next week. Bye.